Uh, so people are saying that's better. Okay, great. All right, well, I'm going to stop talking now and let Phil go. So it's all yours, Phil. Okay, I got involved in the moon hoax uh, sort of by, not accident, I wouldn't call it that. It was just, just the way things worked out, actually. Um, I was interested in it. I'd heard about it for years and uh, hadn't really done much about it and hadn't really written about it. But then when I was writing my first book, which is called Bad Astronomy, about myths and misconceptions, it seemed like a good chapter to add. And in fact, I'd been asked about it by Michael Shermer, who was the head of the Skeptic Society. He was doing a TV show debunking uh, scientific myths and, and things like that. And he'd asked me to participate, and I couldn't because I didn't know enough about it. And that really made me think about it. He needed somebody right away. I couldn't do it, but it made me sort of think about it and started writing about it. Uh, right around the time I was doing that, is when Fox TV aired a conspiracy theory show called Did We Land on the Moon? And, you know, it would have been a pretty short show if they had just said yes. So they had a bunch of stuff in there that was just ridiculous. All kinds of claims about Apollo being fake, the pictures being wrong, all kinds of stuff. And I wrote it up, uh, put it on the website, which was brand new back then. This is back in 2001. And it just got linked everywhere. A whole bunch of people saw that show and searched the web and found my website basically tearing the show to shreds. And then that's how I got started. I developed a talk, basically a public talk I could give on it, and I still give it. It's been, golly, 10 years now? And I still get invited to give that talk. It's incredible. But that's, that's where this all comes from. And it's amazing to me that there's still interest in this because really it has been ripped to shreds. I mean, if the Mythbusters take it on and tear it apart, you're done. But it's still out there. Okay, now what? I can't hear you. <laughs> Should I read the chat questions, I suppose? Oh, now I hear you. Yeah. Um, I don't know, unless there's anything more you want to say, yeah, we can just start hitting the questions because obviously we're going to have a lot of them tonight. Yeah, we can just start hitting the questions because obviously we're going to have a lot of them tonight. So I'm just reading some of the questions here. No way the deniers will ever change their mind. As Phil once wrote, you could take them to the Tranquility Base and they'd accuse you of drugging them. I think that's true. I've run into a handful of the people. You, you got to realize, they're the people who are out there promoting this idea. And then there are the people who just kind of buy into it. And the people who buy into it, I can understand it. When it's presented to them the way it is, if you don't understand the science behind it or that sort of thing, it's easy to go, huh, that's interesting. And then if you look it up, you go, oh, that's what's really going on. So I understand that. It's the people who are promoting it, who are out there saying, this is what's going on. They're writing the books and making the videos. And I bumped heads with these guys plenty of times. And, you know, given the overwhelming evidence that we went and the overwhelming evidence that their claims are wrong or have nothing to do with Apollo. Uh, you know, they, they bring out all kinds of conspiracy theory ideas that really have nothing to do with the meat, the core of this conspiracy theory. You know, really, it's clear they will never, ever, ever say, golly, you're right. And of course, they turn around and say, well, what could convince you that it was hoaxed? And I would say, anything that you claim, you know, if anything that you claimed actually turned out to be true, I might have to scratch my head and say, huh. But it turns out every single time they bring something up, it's like wrong or a misunderstanding or, uh, like I said, they, they, they bring up these ideas and you say, but what does that have to do about faking the moon landing? What does the government lying to the population have to do with the moon landing? Just because the, the government lies doesn't mean they always lie about everything, you know? And so it's that sort of conspiracy theory. And... Uh, yeah, you could bring them there. You know, we've got pictures from Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. We've got hundreds and thousands of pictures from Apollo, of the Apollo sites that are looked at by countries who are not our friends and who were not our friends in the 1960s and 70s. And they didn't say anything. So, you know, they were the ones who had the reason to blow the whistle if it were true. And they didn't. So, there you go. Um, yes. Right. So, people are writing stuff while I'm blathering on and on. And people are bringing up Bill O'Reilly, of course. Um, Bill O'Reilly uh, has uh, Bill O'Reilly, the conservative talk show host, has made a name for himself talking about how we don't understand the tides, and that that proves that that God exists, which is funny uh, because it, it it doesn't. He's whether or not you believe in God, it's a bad idea 
to start to try to make claims and say, because we don't understand something, God must have done it. Because what happens is eventually science will explain something and then you're left with one less argument. And he was saying about tides, tide comes in, tide goes out, never a miscommunication. And he says this over and over and over again. Sun comes up, sun comes down, never a miscommunication. In other words, nature never seems to miscommunicate with itself. How could it be so perfect? God must have done it. And you can look at this and say, oh, well, we understand where tides come from. We know why the sun rises and sets. And so he made a, a follow-up video saying, well, we don't know how the moon got there, or how the sun got there. And it's like, well, actually, yes, we do. We do, in fact. And so his arguments are, are pretty bad. But, you know, it's Bill O'Reilly. What do you expect? I'm not going to pull any punches with him. <laughs> oh, let's see. Look at all these questions. I can't even keep up with this. Um... How come there are no high-resolution satellite photographs or fly-by photos of the landing sites? This would be on the moon, I assume. That's from Jake. In fact, there are. The Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter is a NASA mission that launched a couple of years ago. It's been orbiting the moon for over a year now. Uh, I can't remember the exact date, but it's been over a year. And it actually takes images of the surface of the moon, and it can resolve objects that are less than... Well, you can't see it in my my short video here, but like a yard across. So if there's a rock the size of a car, it can see that on the moon. And in fact, it's taken imagery of, I think all of the Apollo landing sites. And I know a couple of them like Apollo 14 and Apollo 11, it's done it several times. And you can actually see the lander sitting on the moon. You can see uh, the footprints of the astronauts, which is incredible. And some of the other, some of the other uh, artifacts that they left there, they're, they're right there and you can see them, it's really cool. Um, I'm thrilled that they were able to do that. Of course, that won't convince the, the people who believe the hoax because why would they believe more NASA pictures, right? But, uh, you know, maybe, maybe some other folks, it might actually convince them. Um, let's see. Do I see the moon hoax meme ever fading away to the point that it's no longer ingrained in our culture? Well, actually, you know, back 10 years ago, it was huge. I mean, all the mail I got after that Fox show for months was about the moon hoax. And um, there were a couple of guys out there uh, promulgating this, talking about it all the time. You know, they, my, radio, TV, everything. And uh, so it was very popular. And there were, there were other TV shows that were made about it. And I did actually a couple of documentaries. They, were, they interviewed me about it. Uh, so it was very popular. Now it's really rare to see anything like that. The only place this really exists now is on the web. And there will be people who will breathe their dying breath talking about how NASA faked the moon landings. I don't know how popular this is outside of those folks. There are surveys that say 20% of the people have questions about it or 6% think the landings were faked, which is funny because mostly 6% is usually in the margin of error. If you ask enough people, are you dead? 6% will say yes. So you can't trust that kind of low statistics. Um, but, but I don't know what it's like out there now. I know that a lot of kids ask about it because they didn't grow up with Apollo like I did. I actually saw Apollo 15 launch. I was there, saw the Saturn V go up. It was awesome. Um, but now NASA is different. You've got the shuttle, you've got constant delays, there are all kinds of failures, and that's the NASA that people think about now, not the, not the go-get-em NASA that I grew up with. So it's easier to buy into NASA faking uh, the moon missions, I think, until you look at the evidence and then you realize it's all uh, uh, baloney. I'll be polite here because I imagine there are kids present. Um, let's see. Boy, the, they're coming fast and furious here. Uh, scrolling up, uh, what do you feel is the most difficult moon hoax to debunk? What's the most difficult idea to debunk? Wow. Um, the, the science stuff is easy. Why are there no stars in the sky? And when you look at the pictures, the, the sky is black. Well, that's easy. The astronauts were taking pictures of the astronauts on the moon and the lunar surface, which was lit by the sun. So they used slow film and a little tiny aperture in their camera and fast exposure times, and the stars don't show up in the film. Done. Right. That's, so that's easy. And I could go into a little more detail. You see the flag waving and there's some shadow issues and things like that. All that stuff is it's technical. It's easy to explain. The hard part are the sort of societal claims. You know, why did the head of the moon program go to Antarctica just months before Apollo 11? 
because uh, he wanted to go. He, you know, he, he could do anything he wanted. He wanted to go and he had a chance, so he went. Uh, you know, what about this NASA program that was in case the astronauts died and they were going to do this and this and this? It's like, well, what about it? It has really nothing to do with the idea that NASA faked the missions. So those sorts of things are tougher because they're not based on scientific evidence. If you show me a claim that says, you know, this photograph was faked, then I can show you why it wasn't or maybe the photograph was touched up that happened some of the some of the photographs were manipulated a little bit for magazine articles but they weren't fake they were just touched up a little bit to make them prettier stuff like that that's easy but when they don't have a cut and dried answer that's a lot tougher and if somebody confronts you with this stuff it doesn't matter if it's this or 9-11 truthers or homeopaths or whatever when they come up with something and your reaction is, uh, I don't know, or that's not easy to explain, it makes you look like you don't know what you're talking about, and they're all, oh, you, you're CIA spook, and I, I get that all the time. It's very frustrating. Um, and of course, you can't convince somebody of something that they really, 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 truly believe in. They have to walk out of that themselves. So that's, it's, it's, it's hard and it's, it's frustrating and it gets old really quickly. I'll, I'll say that as well. Um, oh, here's a good one from Terry Parks. Could you mention the Van Allen radiation belt? What are the actual levels of radiation? This is one of those scientific uh, claims about the moon hoax that, that actually is a little bit tougher to explain because it's subtle and there's a level of detail to it. There are these fields of radiation that surround the Earth. It's actually, the Earth has a magnetic field, and the, the magnetic field traps charged particles from the sun. These are electrons and protons. And it, it basically catches them, and they're spinning around the Earth at high speed. Now, a lot of these moon hoax guys talk about X-rays in the Van Allen belts, but it turns out magnetic fields have nothing to do with X-rays. Uh, they don't stop X-rays from the sun. It doesn't matter if you're in the Van Allen belt or not. But these charged particles can slam into the metal of your spacecraft and when they do that they, the metal stops them and that splay, that uh, splats out x-rays so you don't the, the Van Allen belts don't have anything directly to do with x-rays they just make the particles hit the metal of the ship and that creates x-rays so when you go up into space and you have a, a radiation detector uh, when the particles hit your radiation detector it detects x-rays they're not directly x-rays but that's what winds up happening there are two levels to the Van Allen belts, an inner one and an outer one. And in the inner one, those radiation levels are pretty high. There's enough particles in there that if you're in there and you were exposed to these particles, it's just like floating out in space, you'd be dead within, you know, 15 minutes or an hour. However, there's no air in space, so you'd actually be dead much quicker, and radiation would be the least of your problems. But if you're in a spaceship, you just don't want to be in that inner belt for very long. And so what NASA did, they knew about these belts. These belts were discovered, actually, on the very first satellite ever launched by the United States, Explorer 1, by James Van Allen, which is why they're called the Van Allen belts. And so what NASA did was they said, golly, we don't want our astronauts in there very long. So they plotted a trajectory that took the astronauts sort of skimming the edge of the belt, and they were only in it for a few minutes. And mind you, since that's really close to the Earth, that's when they were moving the fastest. They were basically coasting to the moon and slowing down most of the way there because of the Earth's gravity. But near the Earth, they were really cooking. And so they, they flew right through that belt very rapidly. They received about as much radiation in a day as you would living on Earth for a year. And it's an elevated amount, but it's not a dangerous amount. And so it's really not a problem. We do have to shield our satellites that orbit over the Earth that go through that, that belt, that's, that's been done. You probably have heard that on board Hubble Space Telescope, they have these 10-year-old computer chips and all that. That's why. It takes a long time to learn how to radiation harden the computers. But uh, as far as people go, we keep the shuttle as far out of that as possible. We, and the astronauts who went to the moon were only in that danger zone for a few minutes, so it wasn't a big deal. And uh, I may have mentioned earlier that it takes me a long time to answer questions because I talk about a lot of different stuff. So there you go. Um, and these things are coming by so quickly, I can't even keep up. Let's see. Do all the Apollo missions have landers left behind? That's a good question. In fact, uh, yes. There were, six, there were seven missions to the moon. Apollo 13 didn't actually land. It circled around the moon and came home. There were six missions that landed. And the lander, I wish I had a model of it. I've actually got a model of it downstairs, but it's, it's a kit. I haven't built it yet. Um, but the lander came down. Here you go. Here's the top and the bottom part. It kind of looks like the lander, doesn't it? Came down, landed on the moon, 
And then the top part blew off and took the astronauts back up into orbit when they were done. They left the bottom part on the moon because it was very heavy and contained all the fuel that they used to get to the moon. Once they landed, they didn't need the bottom part anymore. And since uh, that would be dead weight, and you don't like dead weight when you're in a rocket, they actually split the lander in half. And there was the ascent module, which went back up. And you've probably seen that video of it going up. And so all six of those missions left behind the bottom part of the lander. And you can see that in those Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter missions. If you, go, if you type in LRO, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, LRO, uh, Apollo, you will find lots of pictures. If you go to my blog, badastronomy.com, and type LRO into the search engine, you'll see lots of pictures because I love posting them. It's a lot of fun. Um, can I talk about, ooh, can I talk about helium-3 mining on the moon? Is this a serious consideration? If you've seen the movie Moon, which came out a couple of years ago, uh, the premise of the movie is there's a guy living on the moon who's, who's on this moon base, and he's in charge of these robotic operations, which are sweeping up the dust on the moon and mining helium-3, which is an isotope of helium. It's a different flavor of helium than normal helium. The reason is because helium-3 is really useful for fusion which is a special type of uh, nuclear reaction which releases a huge amount of energy. It's not like uranium where a uranium atom splits and releases energy. If you can take two atoms and squish them together and get, squish the nuclei together, it releases even more energy. And uh, helium fusion will release a tremendous amount of energy and it turns out helium-3 is the easiest of these things to fuse. The thing is, while it's a good idea because there's, there's helium-3 uh, in the solar wind, and so that's constantly blowing on the surface of the moon, and that stuff just sticks to the surface. So all you have to do is scoop up the, the dust, sift it. It's more complicated than just, you know, sifting it. But you can extract the helium-3 and then make your fusion reactions. The problem is, we don't know how to do that. We don't know how to make a fusion reactor with helium-3. Uh, so uh, it's a good idea in theory, and if we can get enough helium-3 and start playing with it and maybe figure it out, yeah, I'm all for it. It's actually a fairly easy source of it. It's easier to get at on the moon than on the Earth, I think. But right now, we have no use for it. It would be like having, um, I don't know, an airplane engine and no engine. Or an airplane hull with no engine. It's like, well, what are you going to do with it? It's just going to sit there. So once we learn how to do it, yeah, I think, I think it's, it's feasible. But that's, that's sometime in the future. I have no idea when. Um, how was the science in the movie Moon? Uh, it was pretty good. I won't give away the ending, the, 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 the sort of the trick of it I won't talk about. But as far as, you know, what the base looked like and how it all worked, uh, I thought that was pretty cool. The, the computer was artificially intelligent, and I, I don't know if we're going to be there anytime soon, but the, the mining operation and all that stuff I thought was pretty much dead on. It was very cool. Um, let's see... <laughs> uh, what are your thoughts at this point on the arsenic-based life form? Still way too early to know. That was a, a whole thing <laughs> last month. So NASA had this uh, story that uh, the scientists had gone to Mono Lake in Nevada, which has uh, very high levels of arsenic in it, and they found these bacteria that apparently lived on it. Now, I'm an astronomer. I do know some biology, and I can read up on this, and it looked legit, but... Uh, friends of mine and, and just other scientists, biologists, were saying that the way they studied these life forms could not exclude uh, the fact that these were not arsenic-eating life forms. Remember, they're not arsenic-based any more than we are, you know, food-based. We're, we're based on we're based on carbon. They're not based on arsenic the way we're based on carbon. They just could use arsenic uh, the way we actually use phosphorus. And there's all sorts of uses for phosphorus in our body, including in our DNA. And it looked like these guys were using arsenic instead of phosphorus, which is bizarre. Uh, and if it's true, that's cool, because that means that life is even more versatile than we thought, and that's good. That means there's a better chance of us finding life on other planets. Um, but these other biologists are saying maybe not. Uh, I don't know where it stands right now. I wrote it straight when I wrote about this because uh, it had been written up in a journal that had been peer-reviewed, and all I could do was report it the way it was being reported. Um, but, you know, keep your eyes open. I'm sure this story will continue. The problem is, of course, it's not a big media blast to say, hey, remember that press conference a year ago about arsenic? Yeah, not so much. So even if it pans out or if it doesn't, don't expect to see a huge press conference about it. You'll just have to keep your eyes open and, and look for it when it when it comes out. 
Um, do I have a favorite myth to debunk? No, I hate all of them. <laughs> um, I don't hate myths. I think they're fun, a lot of them. Uh, it, it is kind of fun to talk about, for example, standing eggs on end on the first day of spring, if you've ever heard that one. That's actually what got me started in the first place. That's this old myth. It's not as popular as it used to be, but it, it's still out there, and it's total baloney. You can stand an egg on end any day of the year. Uh, there are a bunch of them like that that are fun and are, and are harmless. Um, what I would answer this question the other way around and say, which ones do I hate debunking the most? And these are the ones that scare people. Um, that an asteroid is going to hit the Earth and wipe us all out. That Betelgeuse, the star, is going to blow up and wipe us all out. You know, and and these there's been such a flurry of these in the past few weeks. Just today, I wrote an article about uh, this guy who had written for a website saying the Earth's magnetic field is changing, and this is changing our weather and the snowstorms we've been having in the in the United States and Typhoon Yazi, which would just hit Australia, was a huge. Category 5 hurricane, although in the southern hemisphere they're called tycoons. They're tycoons. They're very rich, very wealthy weather systems. Ugh, typhoons, thank you. Um, and he was saying that these superstorms are caused by the magnetic field of the Earth, and that's total garbage, nonsense, terrible science, ridiculous. And yet people are getting scared about that. They see that the Earth's magnetic field is changing, and they, they don't understand it, and they think, oh, this guy's making sense. But the article was just awful, so I debunked it. Hot on the heels of that, you know, just a, well, a week ago I debunked uh, these claims that Apophis, an asteroid, is going to hit us in 2036. Apophis is going to pass very close to us in 2029, and if it passes at just the right distance, the Earth's gravity will sling it around in an orbit that will bring it back in 2036 and hit us. But the odds of it passing at just the right distance in 2029 are like 1 in 250,000, so really, really tiny odds. And so the odds of it hitting us in 2036 are incredibly low. But what happened was this Russian astronomer was interviewed by a journalist in Russia who garbled what the astronomer said and, and said it, w it was going to hit us. It's going to break apart into pieces and those are going to pummel us. And, and that got spread around. Huffington Post picked it up. A bunch of other people picked it up. And people got scared. People say, oh my God, the end of the world is coming in 2036. And no, it's not. This thing's almost certainly not going to hit us. And it's only 200 yards across. Even if it does hit us, it's not a global extinction event. It's going to suck. But it's not a global extinction event. And yet, just today, this got picked up again by Huffington Post and some other places saying that Apophis might hit us. And Huffington Post put up a, a video of a giant asteroid 500 miles across hitting the Earth, which is ridiculous. And, and, you know, doom and gloom and catastrophe because it sells. So literally an hour before we started this webcast, I had to debunk this again. And that really frustrates me. The 2012 stuff really frustrates me because kids get scared about this. So, you know, there are people out there trying to make money off this and they're scaring kids, little kids, you know, eight, 10 years old, whatever. And that is evil. They may honestly believe that what they're saying is true, uh, but it's not. And, and so in, in that case, you know, they honestly believe it. Okay, great. But they're wrong. I know there are people out there who jump on these doomsday things just to hype them up. And that to me is just awful. And that's what I really, really hate writing about. It really frustrates me. It makes me very, very angry. And you wouldn't like me when I'm angry. I'll be nice on my website, but I'm going to call you out on your, on your bull. Um, will I be going on tour with George Robb? <laughs> George is a, uh, a skeptic and a singer. No, he did a song called Death from the Skies, which is based on my book. And it was a pretty funny song. We're not going on tour. I'm hoping to perform it with him at some point, though. That'd be pretty funny. Uh, oh my gosh, look at all these. What's a celebrity people think I look most like? Uh, Brad Pitt. Um, <laughs> no, uh, uh, what's his name? Anthony Edwards from ER, from the first few seasons of ER. And Chris Elliott, the comedian. Yeah, awesome. Um, uh, oh, this is interesting. Should NASA be hijacked into a climate change agency? Hang on, it scrolled by. Or concentrate on solar system science or interstellar. Uh, in fact, NASA's uh, purview is the Earth and space. Uh, so they launch satellites which look at the Earth, and they, of course, launch probes and telescopes that look into space. 
Um, it's the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. So aeronautics is in their purview as well. They do a lot of airplane studies and things like that. So in fact, they have a very broad grasp of the science they should do. And climate change is real. I'm not going to equivocate. I'm not going to say, well, the evidence, blah, blah. Climate change is real. The globe, the globe is getting warmer. Um, is it man-made? Almost certainly. We are certainly contributing to it. How much is uncertain? But uh, clearly, all the indicators, the sea ice, uh, sea temperatures, the air temperatures, all these things are indicating that the Earth is warming up. Um, NASA certainly should be involved in doing this because they have satellites that can observe these sorts of things. NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmosphere Administration, is that right? I think that's right. They do this as well. They have satellites that do it. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, the more the merrier. The more people we have working on this, the better, because I think this is the biggest problem that we are dealing with right now. Uh, it, it's, part, it's two parts of the biggest problem we're dealing with right now. One is that the Earth is warming up, and the second one is that there are so many people in power who are denying it, including those in Congress. Uh, just today, I believe, and, and I'll, again, I'll just I'll come right out and say this, Congress had a hearing about this, about global warming. Not one scientist was called as an expert. They called in a senator uh, who was a global warming denier as, as a witness, but no scientists. So that's probably the biggest problem we're facing right now. Um, let's see. These are going so quickly, I can't even keep up with them. Uh, Ken Brandt, Hammer and Feather on the Moon. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me go back farther. Um, hammer and Feather on the Moon. Going back, going back. Uh, can you type it again, Ken? I'm going back. Oh, drat. These are going by so fast. Um, was that a teaching moment? Somebody said, okay, go ahead and type it again and I'll see what else is here. Um, does NASA have a defense system in place in case a meteor is predicted to impact the Earth? Jeff F. Oh, and Ken Brandt's astronomy class. There you go. Uh, no, and this is a real issue right now. Um, if there were a big asteroid, anything bigger than, say, 150 meters, like Apophis or bigger, that we were to spot... And, it, it, and if it's less than a few years from hitting us, there's essentially nothing we can do about it right now. There is a group called the B612 Foundation. And if you've read The Little Prince, that's the name of the asteroid The Little Prince comes from. But you can look this up, B612 Foundation. They are a group of scientists and engineers, astronomers, and even astronauts. Rusty, Sch uh, Rusty Schweikart from Apollo 9 is on this. My friend Dan Durda, who is an asteroid specialist, is on this. Uh, foundation and they're very interested in learning more about asteroids and how to move them out of the way if there's a problem and uh, they are trying to convince NASA to take this seriously and NASA really doesn't and I'm not sure why I suspect it's because NASA has incredibly tight budget constraints and this is something that would cost about a billion dollars and they just don't have that money the thing to do is to convince Congress that this is important to increase NASA's budget now, we've been buzzed by a few asteroids in the past few days. They were small, literally one, you know, that was, I, I can't get back far enough, but one that was about the size of a sofa and one just uh, today. As a matter of fact, it's, I think it passed us already. I'm not sure exactly when it was supposed to pass, but it was about the size of a car, a small car that passed just a few thousand uh, kilometers away. If these things were to hit, they would explode high in the atmosphere and wouldn't be dangerous. But if we see one the size of a football stadium, the size of a Apophis, or the size of a mountain heading our way, we have to do something about it. We have to be able to spot them, tag them, and get up there and push them out of the way. And right now, we don't have any way to do that. I'm hoping that we'll learn soon because we can use off-the-shelf technology to do this, which means, you know, if you said, here's a check for a billion dollars, you could be just a few years away from having this technology to do it. We know kind of how to do it, but we should be learning how and make sure we understand it before the test becomes an asteroid coming in and we have to test it on something that could actually hurt us. Um, that's, that's, that's my hope for this, at least. Um, can there be a Teach Congress Day? <laughs> um, that's my answer. Uh, a student in Ken Brandt's class, Genevieve Lavette, or Genevieve, that's such a cool name, I love pronouncing it that way, Genevieve. Uh, do you believe in the Mayan prediction that the Earth will be destroyed in December 21st, 2012? No. Uh, oh, uh, if you want details. Uh, okay. 
So you've all heard about this Mayan prediction that the Earth's going to be destroyed in 2012. It is total baloney from top to bottom. The idea is that they have this calendar, and the calendar has cycles, much like we do. We have days and weeks and months and years and decades, and they had these, these different cycles, and it turns out that there's a big cycle that lasts for a few thousand years, 5,000 years, something like that, and it's going to tick over, and it's going to reset back, back to zero, basically, like when your odometer in your car flips over. And so people are saying that this is going to be the end of the world. They're like, N no, it's just... You know, you, you flip your calendar over. It just starts again. You know, that's all it is. These cycles just, you know, the, these all go to zero and this one ticks over to one. That's all that happens. And even the Mayans didn't believe that it was going to be the end of the world. Now, so, so this is based on silliness anyway. The problem is people keep bringing in things that they say are going to happen, like the sun is going to align with the galactic center and there's a black hole there and it's going to rip the earth in half. No, just... No, that's not going to happen. That's ridiculous. As a matter of fact, there is a black hole in the center of the galaxy, but the sun is not aligning with it. The sun gets near, as the Earth goes around the sun, from our viewpoint, the sun seems to pass the galactic center every year. It's been doing this forever. And in fact, it was it, it, the, the, the distance it, it passes the, the, the center. It's just like this. You know, I've got here, I've got this, these two things here. A golf ball that's a little bit smaller than the Earth. I'll do it this way. Um, can I do this? So, no, nah, it's not going to work. Never mind. Everything's backwards. It's hard to do this. The point is, the sun does seem to pass near the galactic center, but uh, from our viewpoint as we look up in the sky, but it turns out that the distance it misses that by, it changes every year. And it was closest actually several years ago, not in 2012, but actually in 1998. So if the end of the world were to happen because of that, it would have been 13 years ago. And as I recall, I brushed my teeth this morning and I had my coffee and I wrote some stuff and that means we weren't destroyed in 1998. That's, that's my guess. Um, people talking about solar flares, that the sun's solar cycle is going to peak in 2012. No. Uh, in fact, it's going to peak much later than that. There will be flares. There, there have been flares now. The sun is getting active again. But it'll, it'll actually peak probably in 2013 with most of the activity coming at the end of the year in 2013 and 2014. Uh, the last time we saw a lot of activity was in about 2003. The sun was actually quite uh, throwing quite the hissy fit. Um, but it didn't really hurt us too much here on Earth. It's almost impossible for the sun to have an event so huge it would kill us. The worst really that could happen is a big solar flare would send all those subatomic particles into the Earth's magnetic field. Ah, we're coming back to that again. And that could actually blow out our power grid here on Earth. That happened in Quebec in 1989. And uh, it can cause brownouts or blackouts. Uh, yeah, a really big one could do a lot of damage that way. It could hurt our satellites. It could fry satellites that we use for communication, that banks use to communicate with each other in their databases. So that could hurt us economically. Um, but there's not going to be like a big, huge flare that's going to kill us all. And these other ideas, earthquakes and asteroid impacts and all this stuff, it's nonsense. This stuff is all made up. You know, if the Earth is going to be destroyed in 2012, it has nothing to do with the mines. It has nothing to do with anything else. It'll be something, you know, nuclear war or something. But uh, there's no more danger of that next year than there is this year or last year or the year before. The Earth, you know, we're always in a precarious place. The, the best we can hope for is that, is that we make this Earth as, as best we can, make our situation as best we can, do what we can about what we can, uh, and, and don't worry about doomsday scenarios that are not true. Um, so, so there you go. That's a, how's that for a, a short answer made long? Um, you know, if Ken actually wrote that, it's gone. Uh, <laughs> this question, something about the hammer and the feather, that must be the Apollo 15. Um, maybe that was about uh, uh, Apollo 15. They, they had a hammer and a feather that they dropped in a vacuum. And on, on the Earth, with air, if you drop them, the feather falls slowly and the hammer falls faster. But in the absence of air, what Galileo said, and Newton as well, if you drop them, they should fall at the same rate. And so on Apollo 15, they did that with a falcon feather because the Apollo lander was actually named the falcon. So they dropped a feather and a hammer, and they fell at the same rate, hit at the same time. It's a pretty cool demonstration. And, oh, Ken Brandt's saying, gravity teaching moment, yes. And in the Mythbusters TV show, uh, where they debunked the moon hoax, they, they basically did that. And it was a pretty cool little experiment, and if you can get a copy of that, uh, that's a great teaching moment. You can do this in your class. Uh, get a grapefruit and a grape. You know, two things that weigh very different amounts, um, but that are still heavy enough that air resistance isn't a problem. Hold them up and be careful. 
you know, here, here I'm going to hold these two things. If you hold them up like this, you know, you don't want to do that. You want to hold it so that the bottoms are even, not so that the middles are even, and then let go of them, and they'll fall at the same rate and hit at the same time. Most, if you ask your students beforehand, which will hit first, especially, ooh, something like this. This is a squishy ball, so it's very lightweight. This is a golf ball, so it's heavier, but it's smaller. So, you know, some people will say, I think that'll, this will hit first because it's heavier. No, this will hit first because it's bigger, you know, and they'll argue about it, and then you let go, and it turns out they hit at the same time. That's awesome. Make them make predictions first and write them down and then find out how many people were wrong. Uh, that's the kind of stuff I love doing. Um, oh, and Ken's saying, unbelievable how many people don't know the moon has gravity. That's correct. Uh, a lot of people think gravity has to do with spin for some reason. And I, I didn't even know that until a couple of years ago. But they, they say, you know, the Earth is spinning and that's why it has gravity. And when astronauts go into space, they're weightless because they're not spinning. And I thought, that's interesting. Of course, it has nothing to do with spin. It has to do with how much mass you have. So there is gravity on the moon. And it's a very common misconception that there's no gravity on the moon. And there's this, this urban legend. I don't know if this is true or not. I have tried to, to research this, uh, but I keep hitting a dead end. But there's this claim that somebody at college heard this, this idea that people thought there was no gravity on the moon. And they knocked on the doors of all their, their dorm mates and said, OK, you're standing on the moon, you've got a pen in your hand, and you let go of it. Does it float up? Does it fall down? Or does it hover? And evidently, a lot of people answer that it hovers. And when you ask them why, they would say, there's no gravity on the moon. And the legend has it that then he asks, well, then what kept the astronauts on the moon? And they would say, ah, heavy boots. <laughs> if you actually look up heavy boots on the web, you'll find that story. I love that story. Um, let's see, I'm looking for actual questions. Ooh, will the earth, okay, this is from Fabio Miguez, Miguez, oh, my Spanish is terrible, I, I apologize in advance. Will the earth experience tidal locking prior to our sun expiring? That's a good question. Um, this, the moon, I use my, my little model of science here, the moon goes around the earth, and it always keeps the same face to the Earth. I don't know if you can see this, but I have the little, little Top Flex logo there. And if I, if I don't spin the moon, then uh, I don't think this is going to work so well here. Um, yeah, it's not going to work. The point is, as the moon goes around the Earth, if it weren't spinning, we would see all 360 degrees of the moon over the course of one orbit, one month. But the moon is spinning. It's spinning on its axis. And that way, it's always keeping the same face to the Earth. And that's not a coincidence. It's because the gravity interaction between the moon and the Earth, the tides, over billions of years, has slowed the moon's spin so that it now spins once for every time it goes around the Earth. It also means that the moon is moving away from the Earth. It's very complicated why this happens. You can, if you go to my, uh, if you look up uh, bad astronomy moon tides, you'll probably find my explanation on my website. I actually talk about this step by step. It's really cool, actually, how that works. But it turns out the sun has a tidal effect on the Earth as well. And Earth's spin is slowing and moving out from the sun very, very slowly because of this. Um, I don't, uh, uh, the question is, how long will it be before the Earth's spin slows enough that it is tidally locked to the sun and always shows the same face? And the answer is, I don't know. I think, I think that would take many, many, many billions of years, maybe more. And the sun only has about five or six billion years more before it expands into a red giant and cooks the earth into a toasty, toasty black cinder. Uh, and so I don't think uh, we're going we're gonna to last that long. So the, so the answer to your question is no, but that's not the fun way to answer it. The fun way to answer is to talk about all that cool stuff. Um, uh, Phil, what is the most astounding example of ignorance you've heard from the moon landing hoax believers? That's, that's beautifully phrased, Chu. Um, because ignorance just means lack of knowledge, right? So you can be ignorant and be smart, or not. Um, I do get a lot of funny ones. Um, I, I, a couple of them I would need to show you pictures, uh, because, I, because it, I'd have to show you how the picture works and everything. But uh, without having to resort to that, my favorite claim is that I will ask people when I give talks about this, why did we go to the moon? In, in, in four words, why did we go to the moon? And the answer is, to beat the Soviets. Right? It was a space race. So we went to the moon to beat them. If it was so obvious that we had faked the moon landings, why didn't the Soviets say anything? And I swear to Flying Spaghetti Monster, 
the answer I get from some of these guys is we paid them off with shipments of wheat. You see, in the 1970s, the Soviet Union were having droughts and all kinds of problems. They couldn't grow enough wheat. We were shipping them wheat. But, of course, that we actually, the government said, yeah, if you say anything about this, we, we won't ship you wheat. Brilliant. Uh, so so I, I would have to say that's, that's way up there as far as ridiculous examples of it. Um, Ken Brandt student here, William Wallace. Why do you, th I, really? I have a friend who's an astronomer named Bill Wallace. That's funny. Why do you think people were so determined to prove the moon landing was faked? Well, some of them honestly believe it. They really do. And, and you can imagine, if you thought you had stumbled on the biggest government conspiracy theory of all time, you'd want to talk about it too. If I found out, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be the moon landing, it could be anything, but if I found out the moon, the, the moon, if I found out the government had, you know, uh, radio receivers in our coins, oh God, I'm probably going to start a great conspiracy theory here, so that they could keep track of us, right? And they're listening to me now on the, the pile of change, you know, in, on my desk here. Um, I'd want to tell people about it. I think that would be important for people to know. So if people really believe in the moon hoax, they want to do it. Some people are con artists and simply want to sell their books and videos. I've run across these people as well. I won't name names because I don't want to get sued, uh, but uh, they're out there. Um, and there are other people who just want the attention. Maybe, you know, they find out that as they talk about this, people start listening to them and they start, they start getting the attention. Uh, that's a, that's almost like a drug for some people. And, you know, once they start getting others listening to them, they, they want more and more and more and more. It happens. Um, and I get people, uh, you know, saying, you know, asking me, are these people crooks? Are they mentally ill? What's going on? I say, you know what? It doesn't matter. Uh, well, in some cases it might, because if they're also saying there's an alien sitting on their shoulder that's invisible and talking to them about this, you might want to take that in when you're looking at their other evidence. But it almost doesn't matter why they're saying it. The point is they're wrong. So it doesn't matter where that information is coming from or why they're saying it. If they're making a claim and it's evidence-based and I show that the evidence is wrong, we're done. So it doesn't matter why they're saying it. What matters is what they're saying. Um, gee, there's a name coming up in the chat room a lot. Richard Hoagland. I don't, I don't know what that has to do with anything. Um, another student in Ken Brandt's class. Boy, you're a chatty group. Um, that's awesome. Uh, let me ask, what, uh, what, is this a high school? Uh, what is this? If, if somebody can, can let me know what's going on there. That's cool. I love that there's so many students here coming in and doing this. Uh, don't give them extra credit, though. Ah, university. Oh, UNC. My sister went to UNC Chapel Hill. There you go. Um, let's see. I just saw one. Um, where'd it go? Where'd it go? Where'd it go? College astronomy class. Awesome. And UNC, wait a minute, it's eight, it's almost nine o'clock there. You guys should be out observing. Is it clear there? You guys getting a lot of, uh, a lot of snow like we are. Um, where did it go? Is it possible for surrounding planets to explode? Oh, um, yeah, I get that sometimes. People ask about exploding planets. To my knowledge, a planet cannot simply explode. There's no way for that to happen. Um, the amount of energy it would take to blow up a planet the size of the Earth is huge. Uh, it's it's like billions and billions and billions of times all of our nuclear weapons added together. So it's really hard to blow up a planet, Death Star notwithstanding. Um, but one way you could do it is collide another big object into it. Our moon was formed when something the size of Mars hit the Earth at an oblique angle, at a, at a, at a shallow angle, knocked all this debris into orbit, and that coalesced to form the moon. If that had hit us straight on, uh, it probably wouldn't have disrupted the Earth, but it, it would have done a, you know, a huge amount of damage. If, if, uh, if a planet got hit by another planet, yeah, you could destroy it. What would that do to the Earth? Uh, you know what? I don't know. Um, if Mars were to be hit by some huge object the size of Mercury, I would imagine some debris would hit the Earth. I don't know how much or if it would be a problem. Um, or how long it would take. It might be centuries before it would take that stuff long enough to, to, to hit us. Um, but that's a pretty cool question um, that should be brought up to people who study that kind of thing, because they do. People who study how solar systems form, and they're having the time of their life right now because of all this new data from, about these new planets and solar systems we're discovering. Um, 
they actually model how planets can actually move back and forth in the solar system. A lot of these planets that we're discovering are these giant Jupiter-like planets that are really close into their star, where we know they cannot form. They literally cannot form there. They must have formed farther out and moved inward. Uh, and so planets can collide. It's an interesting problem. Uh, and I'd actually love to see uh, love to see somebody doing a simulation of that. That would be awesome, wouldn't it? That'd be good science. How much of the physics of the movie Sunshine was accurate? Um, the movie Sunshine was interesting. I liked the science parts of it. Um, I didn't care for the last half so much. It's a long story. Um, in fact, the science advisor for that movie is Brian Cox, who is a scientist in England. You've probably seen him on TV. He's getting to be pretty famous now. Um, and he's a pretty cool guy. They brought him in or after they had already written most of the show, so he had to actually sort of come up with some stuff to explain it. It, it, the, the premise of the movie is uh, the sun's nuclear, fu it, the sun fuses nu uh, fuses uh, atomic nuclei in its core, and that's how it generates heat and energy, and that has somehow shut off, and so humans have to launch this s weird thing. I think they call it a Q bomb that's going to fall into the sun and reignite the sun's core. Um, technically, I should say theoretically, that's all possible, although it, the sun can't really turn off. But Brian sort of came up with a sort of a crazy scheme for how that could happen uh, using the laws of quantum mechanics and how you could restart it. Um, so that part, which people think is really crazy, is actually one of the things that actually makes kind of sense. Um, there were some other, there's a lot of orbital mechanics issues. They, they kind of park near Mercury, which is impossible. But uh, the one scene where they pass by Mercury and Mercury transits the sun, it passes in front of the sun, and they're all watching it is riveting that is one of the best scenes i just love that um i'd recommend the movie it's interesting uh, it's creepy and weird toward the end but it's an interesting flick i liked it um let's see could right, intelligent life exist asks sorry i just want to interrupt real quickly and, and just kind of give you a countdown here so we'll go about another 10 minutes. okay Okay, Audrey is saying I love to talk. That's true. I love answering questions. This is fun for me. It makes me think about stuff. Um, my real problem is I can't stop. <laughs> um, oh, wow. There's a, what's my favorite science fiction show? That's a tough one, actually. I'm really digging Stargate Universe, which just got canceled. Thank you. Um, it made me go back and watch the... Uh, I'm watching the old Stargate SG-1 episodes. I'm really, I'm really liking it. I like Fringe. There you go. I like, I like Fringe. Um, and Big Bang Theory. I don't even know. I'm not even sure what TV I watch now. I, I stopped watching TV for a long time. Now I'm watching them a lot again. As far as books, uh, I like hard science books. I like Aliens. I like Spaceships. Uh, Ring World, Larry Niven's stuff from the 70s uh, is really good. And uh, John Scalzi, who is an author um, uh, writing books now, his Old Man's War stuff is really good. So S C A L Z I, John Scalzi, he's pretty awesome. Um, yeah, Stargate Universe got canceled. It's really frustrating because uh, I thought it was really, really, really good. Did I see Caprica? No. You know what? I have not watched Caprica. Uh, I feel bad because Jane. I know Jane Espenson, who's the who's the you know producer, and uh, I I just haven't had a chance to watch it. Uh, I, I saw Battlestar Galactica, and uh, I know Caprica got canceled as well. And so it's crazy, all these shows. Uh, Eureka and Warehouse 13 on Sci-Fi Channel. I really like those, too. I think they're very funny shows. Um, the science on them is not terrible. Uh, the, the Eureka, the science advisor, is a friend of mine. I've done a lot of stuff with him in the past, and he's, he's funny. So they base a lot of it on science. And then, of course, you know, it's a TV show, and it's a comedy. So they, they take that science and extrapolate it crazily. And that's, that's where the fun is. Uh, but they base it all on pretty solid science. They take an idea and run with it. So I actually, I rather like that. Um, I don't have a problem when science is abused per se. I don't like it when um, uh, there are inconsistencies in it, when they do one thing one week and then totally forget about it the next week. Uh, but if they're consistent and it's fun uh, and, it, and it gets people excited about the science, I'm all for it. Um, wow, they're flying through here. Uh, I've read something about the letter C being on a rock in a photo from the moon landing. Yeah, oh golly, the C rock. Um, there's this picture of a rock that has what looks like the letter C on it. And there's this guy who, who said that it was a set dressing, that, that when they were putting together the moon landing set, they labeled everything with letters and they forgot to pull the letter off. Okay, 
first of all, dumbest idea ever. Uh, because they just they don't do that. You know, you can ask anybody who who works on on TV shows and movies. They don't label things like that for that exact reason, so they don't forget. And then you would see something like that. Plus, if you look at the original lunar photos, that rock does not have that C on it. It was only in later pictures. And what happened was a hair got in between the negative and the print. Yeah, I don't even know if kids know about. You used to have these things called negatives, and you would have to print them on paper, and you could hold it in your hand instead of on a screen. And um, if a hair got in between the negative and the paper, uh, you'd get this, you'd get like a little curly hair in there. And that's what that is. The sea rock is just a hair on there. And, and that, that's, that's one of those ideas. It's like, really? Uh, that's, it, it's really silly, but boy, a lot of people buy into it. It was left behind by the Cookie Monster. That's correct. There's actually a crater on Mercury. There's this crater with a C in it. It's a, I, I think it's a, the crater partially collapsed, but it looks like a copyright symbol. And I wrote about that on my blog, actually. It really made me laugh. I thought it was pretty funny. Um, uh, oh, Ken asked something here, but dang it, something about Gene Cernan on Apollo 17. But again, I have to scroll up. Lila May. Hey, Melissa. There's a friend of mine in here. I see a couple of friends. Is there a controversy over whether or not the dinosaurs were wiped out by an asteroid impact? Um, kind of, sort of. The idea is that a, something about six miles across, the size of Mount Everest or bigger, hit the Earth 65 million years ago and wiped out the dinosaurs. There is some evidence that some dinosaurs lived for a period of time after the impact. Whereas the, the, the leading idea is that, no, they were just all wiped out. Within actually weeks or a couple of years, they were all dead. The only thing that was left were animals smaller than about a raccoon. Everything else died. Um, it's unclear to me what the state of the art is with that. There's a lot of arguing about it. It's, I don't think anybody argues that an asteroid is what did 99.9% .9 of the damage. Um, it, it, it may not have happened as quickly as we thought. I'm, I'll, I'll say that. I'm not an expert. I've talked to people who are experts and they, they say, no, nah, no, nah, it was the asteroid. Uh, so we'll see. It's, it's, it's cool. I like the fact that we didn't know why it happened. And then there was this asteroid theory and everybody thought it was crazy, but then they found the evidence for it. And then everybody said, oh, well, it was an asteroid. And now we're questioning that. That's how science works. You, you find evidence for stuff. You come up with an idea if it's wacky and there's no evidence, there's no evidence. But if you find evidence for it, hey, Maybe, maybe there's something to it. But then if more evidence comes along and it makes it weaker, that's okay too, because that means we're getting closer to what really happened. Um, that's what I love about this kind of stuff. Um, we keep learning, and that's what science is all about, is learning. Um, wow, there's just, uh, let's see here. Noisy astronomer. Hi, Nicole. Say it louder. That's how, sci that's how science works. We have a professional astronomer here. Noisy astronomer. She has a good blog too. Look up noisy astronomer on the web. She writes about radio stuff, though. It's stuff you can't see, so I don't really believe in it. Um, let's see. Last Man on the Moon. I did not read Last Man on the Moon. That's by Gene Cernan. Um, I, I have not read all the Apollo books. There are a lot of them. I've got a shelf full sitting over there. And I've, I've read all the ones I've got, but I haven't been able to read all of them. Um, what is the name of my website? Bad Astronomy. Just look up my name. Uh, you'll find it. Bad Astronomy is my website. I write for Discover Magazine now. Um, num, 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 de -deep, de -deep, de -deep, something, oh, yeah, I'm sorry, Ken, your things keep flashing by so quickly, I can't, uh, I can't keep up with what you're trying to write, um, oh, does Gene Cernan's daughter Cindy figure into the rock with the C initial, I don't think so, he did something, I think he, 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 um, he wrote his, her initials, CG, when she was a baby, she was a little kid when he when he went to the moon, and he wrote her her initials in the dust on the on the lunar surface, I think. Um, and I just saw one. Where did it go? Something about my favorite mission. What near midterm astronomy mission are you most interested in? Examples like James Webb. Um, James Webb is the successor successor to Hubble. It's going to have a six meter mirror that's almost twenty feet across. It'll unfold like a flower out in space. I'm very excited to see that happening. They're actually building it uh, not far from where I live. It's being built in Boulder. Uh, a lot of my friends with whom I worked on Hubble are working on that now. So, you know, I've got an eye on it. It's not going to launch for quite some time. It's still being built. Um, but when it launches, it's going gonna, it's gonna to produce images and science that are going to be incredible. Very excited about that. It's going to be able to see galaxies 
clearly that we can only just barely see now because they're so far away. So what this thing is going to do for science is going to be amazing. Um, there are some space probes, uh, one's being planned to Europa, a moon of Jupiter, that I'm very excited about. Um, there's talk of building a giant telescope, the 30 meter telescope, which is 100 feet across. There's also a 100 meter telescope that some people are talking about building. If you can imagine a telescope the size of a football field, and I'm sure noisy astronomer will now make fun of me because there are radio telescopes that big. Optical telescopes are much harder to build that size. Um, but that would be uh, amazing because something that size would be able to see incredibly faint and incredibly distant objects with amazing detail. Uh, it's hard to, you can't even imagine what something like that would do for astronomy. Um, and it would probably cost less than Hubble. <laughs> but it's just the technology to build it would be really, really tough. Um, was it hard for me to get started with bad astronomy? <laughs> no, actually, I started in, in 93 when I was still in grad school, and um, uh, it was easy. I just you know started writing about myths and misconceptions. The hard part is stopping. There's no stopping this. It keeps going. People keep saying things that are wrong and trying to convince other people of things that are wrong. So that will never, never, never end. And even if the astronomy stuff ends, there's always going to be homeopathy and acupuncture and anti-vax people and other, you know, other things like that that I can always write about. So I think I'll be okay. <laughs> Would I like my own TV show? Yes. Um, working on it. I haven't heard from the network yet about whether Bad Universe will get picked up. Um, uh, the first two have aired. I, I don't know when the third one's going to air. I'm, I'm hoping they'll pick it up as a series. I just, I don't know. Uh, you know, the person involved is the last person to know, I guess. Uh, views on science education. Uh, teaching science is hard, and uh, the way we have it set up in this country is memorizing stuff instead of doing and instead of learning, instead of seeing the process. And so it's a disaster in this country. We have um, a large fraction of biology teachers teaching creationism, which they should be fired for doing because that is against the Constitution. Um, we have very few teaching evolution. Uh, we have a whole bunch who are afraid of teaching evolution. That's ridiculous. Evolution is the modern basis of, a, of, of biology in the same way that Newton's laws are the basis of physics and relativity is advanced physics. I mean, it, it's, it, it, not teaching it is terrible. The kids learn nothing about biology that way. So, um, you know, if, if you believe in creationism, if you're very religious, that's fine, but it is illegal to teach it in school. So I have, you know, I'm not going to say anything about the religion itself, just that it's unconstitutional to teach it in school. Uh, and, and the fact that young earth creationism is wrong, and I will state that very clearly. Um, so I'm, I'm unhappy with the state of science education, but I think a lot of it stems from politicians who are making it easier for that sort of thing to happen. So I wish that uh, we had stronger science in politics, because I think that would, pardon the expression, trickle down into more aspects of life. Um, still got some time here, Andrew? I was going to, this I guess would be that 10 minutes I mentioned earlier, but if you'd like okay. to, you've got so much coming at you, you want to take another 10 minutes? Sure. I can do this all day. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Would things be better if a scientist ran for office? Um, in fact, there are scientists um, in, uh, in Congress. Uh, you know, and the names escape me. I don't have them on the tip of my tongue. I wrote about one in Illinois and uh, who was a particle physicist who won, I believe he's in the house or he won a couple of years ago. Uh, there are a couple of others. Um, Newt Gingrich uh, has a degree in advance, I believe an advanced degree. And I want to say biology. You can look this up. Um, but he was instrumental in tearing apart the uh, Office of Science and Technology, which was the... Um, uh, group of people who were put together to aid Congress in scientific and engineering and technology issues. And yet uh, Congress uh, dismantled them. Uh, so it, I don't know, it doesn't make any sense to me. Um, I have no desire to run for president. If, if I'm elected president, I'm taking all the money and running away and you'll never see me again. This happened a couple of years ago when they were looking for somebody to run NASA and on, uh, as a joke on some website, somebody said, you know, make Phil head of NASA. And I said, if you do that, I will take a billion dollars out of NASA's budget and disappear. That is, that is my campaign promise to you. Um, so there you go. So nobody can blame me if I get elected and that's what happens. Uh, wow, look at all this. Um, 
What's my favorite feasible yet still fictional mega structure? Yeah, that's kind of a cool idea. Um, it's sort of a huge structure that could that maybe could be built. I'd have to say a space elevator. Um, they're currently fictional, but technically or ideally they could be built. And this is this is literally a twenty thousand mile high elevator to space. And um, I, I won't go into the details here, but it it should work if you had a material strong enough. You could build an elevator to space, and uh, it it once it's built and it would cost a gazillion dollars. Um, you could just take an elevator car into orbit. You don't have you don't need rockets anymore. Um, the thing is, I think realistically, it's never going to happen. Um, as long as somebody can fly an airplane into it, uh, you can't build them. And I think you know what I mean by that. I think they're just too vulnerable, and they're you know a meteor could hit them, and and totally destroy them. So uh, I just I just don't see that happening anytime soon. Uh, Dyson spheres. I don't believe in Dyson spheres. Uh, that's the idea that you totally encase a star in a shell, a hundred million miles in radius. This is basically the size of the Earth's orbit, and it captures all the energy from the star, and then you can use that to power your civilization. Um, I just don't see a need for them. I think that there are easier ways of getting energy than encasing a star. And actually, if you can dis to to build one of the things, you'd basically have to dismantle a planet. And the amount of energy that takes is as much energy as you get from the star. By the time you can dismantle a planet, you don't need a Dyson sphere. You've got some other energy source you can use. So um, I I just don't I don't see the need for it. Um, uh, comments on the Kepler findings. Ah, from Tree Lobsters. Hi, Tree Lobsters. Uh, I think they're cool. I wrote about uh, the two big findings. One is that they just released their first data set where they have 1,200 planet candidates. Kepler is this telescope which is looking in one part of the sky, and if a, if a planet happens to pass between us and the star, then it blocks some of the light from the star and it gets dimmer. And it can see that dip in the starlight. And it's discovered 1,200 potential planets this way. Uh, some of them are pretty solid. They look like, I mean, some of the results look solid, not that the planets are solid. Some of the results look like they're real, um, but they need to be confirmed. What's interesting is that uh, several dozen of these planets are at the right distance from their star to have liquid water. And some of them are low enough mass that they might be solid planets like the Earth which is intriguing, um, but we don't know. We have to confirm them. And the other big result is that it found another system, Kepler-11, uh, which has, five, it has six planets in total, but five of them are huddled in so close to the star that if they were orbiting our sun, they'd be inside Mercury's orbit. And of all the things that we've seen, I would have put good money down that that was impossible, simply because those planets would... Their gravity would they would interact with each other and they would they would they would uh, pull each other into crazy orbits and they'd, they'd all fly apart um, and yet there it is and it's confirmed I saw the data that they published it's it's obvious yeah they got it that's what's going on crazy and what that means is that nature knows more about making solar systems than we do which isn't terribly surprising but is very cool because that means we have to update our models and keep our minds open to what is possible. And things that we thought were impossible may not be, which is always a good thing. I like I, I like it when we're when we're wrong, because that means there's more cool stuff going on. Um, any comments on the thirteenth zodiac sign? Yes. Uh, let's see next. <laughs> yeah, it's that whole thing was silly. Uh, you know what? I I want to talk about it. Just go to my just go to my blog. Go to badastronomy.com. It'll take you to the, my Discover Magazine website. Type in zodiac or astrology or whatever, and you'll you'll see what I've writ, writ, written about it. That whole thing was really really silly. Can you, can you have a tour of my office? Yeah, the door behind me leads to my bathroom. Um, the little glowy thing on this side is uh, a flying saucer lamp, which you can't really see very well. Yeah, you know, oh, it's over here actually. Where am I? Left and right are switched. That is so confusing. I don't know how to what I'm. I'm okay. Um, Let's see. Stereo probes, 3D view of the sun. Seen it yet? Yeah, I wrote about that on Sunday. There are these two probes that were launched in um, opposite directions. So as the Earth is going around the sun, they launched one going ahead of the Earth and one going behind it. And as they've been separating, they've finally been able to go around the sun and now are able to see the entire surface of the sun at the same time. We can't see 
what's on the other side of the sun from the earth but these guys can so now we have a view of the entire surface of the sun for the first time and it's very cool because um, we don't have to wait for something to rotate into view for us to see it and that can take a couple of weeks now we just when something happens we see it right away and that really helps the models of uh, the physical models of the the astronomers and who are studying this to understand the sun which i am all for because the sun affects us here on earth and the more we know about it the better well, that's pretty cool uh, John Nguyen says, why is your username bad astronomy? Doesn't it give detractors fuel to attack you? Um, yeah, if they want to say, ooh, he really is a bad astronomer. <laughs> Never heard that before. Um, yeah, I don't care. Uh, the website is about bad astronomy. It's about myths and misconceptions in astronomy. So calling myself the bad astronomer doesn't bug me at all. Um, if they want to make fun of me, then that just shows that they're, they're childish and immature and poopy heads. Um... Is bad astronomer your alter ego? Um, I don't want to alter my ego. I like my ego. Um, uh, wow, look at all this. Uh, I need a cape. Are capes back in? Is that what's happening? There was a Seinfeld episode about that. It was pretty funny. No, I don't wear a cape. I'm a blogger. I hardly ever wear pants. Um, if the moon is able to pass in front of the sun, can another planet do the same thing? Yes. Uh, the only planets that can pass directly in front of the sun in our solar system from our view are the planets that are closer to the sun than we are, and that's Mercury and Venus. Um, Mercury transits the sun. It's called a transit when that happens. Um, every now and again, I've seen one. Venus has this weird pattern where it, 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 it's like 112 or 120 years between transits, but then two of them happen um, eight years apart. So you get one, and then another one eight years later, and then not another one for a century, and then one, and then eight years later, and then another one for a century. The last one was in 2004, I think. And the next one is, I think, I think next year in 2012. The one in 2004 was awesome. I was, um, uh, I, I actually flew to D.C. to do a bunch of uh, uh, talking head interviews, a little bit like this actually, with news stations about it, and talked about it live while it was happening, and actually got to see it with my own eyes. I used filtered glasses and could see, look up at the sun, and I could see Venus as just a little tiny black dot against the sun's surface. It was so cool. That's going to happen again next year, and you know, I would recommend seeing it because that is literally once in a lifetime unless you plan on being around in the year, you know, uh, 2102 or whatever it's going to be for the next one. Um, very cool. If you look up Venus Transit on the web, there are animations of it from spacecraft that took a lot of pictures and they made, you know, little movies out of it. Totally cool. Uh, from Mars, the Earth can transit the sun. Um, and uh, Arthur C. Clarke wrote a story about that called The Transit of Earth, and it's a really good story. You should look it up. It's probably online someplace. Pretty awesome. Um, I saw a couple of questions I wanted to answer pass by, which means I will never see them again. June 6th, 2012. Thank you. That's when the next Venus transit is. June 6th. Uh, isn't that D-Day? Or am I getting that? That's, uh, yeah, I think that's right. Um, what insight do I have on the possibility of life from chemicals and elements that we did not think possible, like arsenic? Um, what's interesting about the arsenic thing is, uh, you know, did, did that bacteria evolve using phosphorus and then evolved the cape? Assuming, assuming that this, this finding is correct, and we still don't know, but did it evolve to use phosphorus like, like we do, like everything else does on Earth, and then because arsenic was available, was able to adapt and evolve to use it? Or did it evolve using arsenic in the first place? This is an important question, because you can imagine... Um, if if life on Earth all started from the same original bit of life, then um, whatever conditions on Earth were to let that life evolve, that's then probably what you would need on another planet. However, if we find life on Earth that is totally different than us, obviously totally different, we don't share any common ancestors, it clearly life evolved totally separate, then that means that you don't need the same conditions to form life like us. You could find a planet that's like Mars or Venus or whatever, and life could evolve that way. And if, if, if that would double the chances, right, if, for life to evolve on some other planet. You can have two different conditions. Maybe there are 10, maybe there are 1,000. And so uh, I don't know. I'm not a biologist. Um, I've studied some of this stuff, and I know there are really bizarre life forms on Earth. There's a bacterium that lives 
two miles deep in the crust that lives off radiation. It lives off, it, it eats chemicals from rocks and lives off radiation. It's bizarre. Um, uh, but I, I don't know if that evolved from the same life form that we evolved with or if it was totally different. Um, and that, uh, that's pretty interesting stuff. I'd love to, I'd love to know, but we, we have people studying that. Um, uh, astrobiologists are what they're called, and they study extremophiles, things that live in extreme conditions. Heat, acidity, vacuum, whatever, and it's pretty interesting stuff. Um, and I sure hope that uh, they find stuff like that, because that would be very exciting as far as uh, chances of life on other planets. Um, uh, it just keeps going on. Why is there no gravity in the center of the Earth? That's a good question. Um, Newton actually showed this uh, when, when he invented calculus, that when you have a solid object, only the stuff between you and the center of that object adds to the gravity. So if you were to dig a tunnel through the Earth and start going down into that tunnel, all the stuff above you doesn't matter anymore. It's only the stuff between you and the center, that mass that pulls on you. And when you get to the center, there's no mass pulling you down, and there is no gravity. So there you go. If you had a hollow sphere, there'd be no gravity anywhere inside of it, which is not intuitive. You can have a hollow sphere, and if, even if you're near the edge, you don't feel any gravity in that direction because the gravity of the rest of it is pulling you just as hard as that little piece next to you. Um, it's, it's not that hard to prove that using calculus, um, but it's, it's not intuitive at all, which is, but, you know, that's cool. The universe doesn't have to be intuitive. Um, so in the movie The Core, should they be floating? No, they should have been dead. Um, the Core is just a... Science is terrible in that movie. I actually enjoyed that movie. My geologist friends hated it, just like I hated Armageddon. I found it an enjoyable movie, uh, but the science was for crap. Um, how do I feel about the next movie coming out, Apollo 18? Yeah, I've heard about it, but I don't really know anything about the movie itself, so I can't really comment on it. I've just heard a little bit about it, but I, I don't know. Uh, there are a couple of movies coming out soon. Uh, a lot of alien invasion movies I'm excited about because they look really cool. Um, but I know they're going to be bad because there's no reason for aliens to invade. Um, it, read Footfall by Larry Niven and, and, and Jerry Purnell, and it's about an alien invasion and how, they, how it would actually work. And, you know, why would they land and shoot us with guns when they could sit there and drop rocks from orbit and pummel us into, into submission? You know, it's, it, it'd be silly for them to try to land on the Earth to take us over, unless they're eating us. But I have, I have problems with that as well. Um... Hey, Phil, sorry. Do I, I support a human mission to Mars? Oh, okay. Uh, pick out the... My, Go ahead, Andrew. Three more. Three more. Three more, okay. Uh, Ken asks, do I support a, a human mission to Mars? Right now, no, um, because it is terribly, terribly expensive, and the political environment being what it is, it would choke out everything else we're doing in space. So I don't think it's a good idea. Um, I would rather see us... Um, doing a, a lunar moon base, uh, f uh, lunar moon base, as opposed to some other type of moon base, um, to do a moon base first and learn how to do that kind of thing uh, before we go to Mars. I'd rather we were sending more sophisticated robots to Mars. Um, I still, I, I support the manned space program. Um, I'd rather see us landing on near-Earth asteroids and having a bigger presence on the moon first. And once we learn more about how to stay in space for a long time, then go to Mars, because I think it's going to be too tough to do it otherwise. Um, do I think we will ever be able to resolve visible light images of Earth-sized planets around other stars? Yes, absolutely. There is no reason why we can't. Um, with Hubble, we have been able to see Jupiter-sized planets around other stars. We actually have images of seven or eight planets orbiting nearby stars. Um, you just need a big enough telescope. And in fact, the James Webb Space Telescope should be able to see planets like Jupiter orbiting stars like the Sun very easily. A hundred meter telescope could do that. Uh, it's not a matter of uh, physics. You just need a big enough telescope to do it. That's all. So yeah, we could do it. I think that would be totally awesome. I'd love to be able to see a picture of a green planet orbiting another star. Um, I, I see your questions, Melissa. I'm ignoring them. Thank you. I have a friend trying to cause problems in the chat room. Um, Oh, when do I think the Higgs boson will be discovered? That's a good question. The Higgs boson is this particle, subatomic particle, which is thought to be the, the reason everything has mass. That particles, that, that you have mass, and I, everything has mass because of this, this other particle that it interacts with. Um, the analogy being that 
um, if you're if you're walking through an empty room, there's there's nothing to stop you. But if there's a crowd of people in the room, you have to kind of you know skirt and scoot around them and do all that. Uh, for an object with mass like us, those people in the room are like the Higgs boson, and and they they kind of keep us from from moving very well. And that's why we have gravity and inertia and all this stuff. Um, but nobody's ever seen it. It's theoretical because it's really hard. You need super high energies to to create them, and and detect them. And that's why the Large Hadron Collider in uh, Geneva was built to to actually that that's its big purpose was to find the Higgs boson. It's this it's the huge it's one of the the holy grails of uh, particle physics right now. They expect they're going to see it within the next few years. Um, most particle physicists I know. Um, don't even think the interesting question is will we see it they're so convinced they'll find it that they, to them that's not the interesting question the interesting question is you know, how much energy will it have what will it really be like when they see it um and that's i mean that's chutzpah that's some <laughs> that's some 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 pretty good uh steel guts there to be able to say oh we know we're gonna find it we just want to know what it looks like um so yeah it could be in the next few years but that's that's not my field and i don't like to comment too much on stuff i'm not that familiar with but I have friends who are very smart, you know, including Brian Cox, the physicist I mentioned before, and uh, they, they think we're going to find it. And when they do, that's going to be a huge moment in physics. Uh, not too much less than, you know, when Einstein discovered relativity or quantum mechanics was discovered in the first place in the year 1900. Uh, so it's, it's going to be a big deal when we, when we learn about that because that'll tell us about gravity and mass and a lot of other fundamental properties of matter. And, and you know, since that was my last question, I'll look at you, Andrew, and let you just nod. Yes, that's your last question. I'll, I'll, I'll say that um, there are a lot of questions in science. And, you know, any scientist like me, when I was doing research, I wasn't looking after big questions. I was trying to find out, you know, why is this thing shaped this way? You know, what's going on here? It wasn't, it, these weren't the big questions. But what the public wants to know are the big questions. You know, why, you know, why did life arise on Earth? How did the sun form? Why is the universe here? You know, why do we have mass? The dumbest questions that you, you would say, well, that's a dumb question, are the hardest ones to answer because they're so fundamental. They're saying something fundamental about the universe itself. And that's what we're trying to answer. And that's what we're answering right now. We have the technology to look at the moments the universe formed. We can see the very first objects that were ever formed in the universe 13.5, 13.7 billion years ago. We're looking at the fundamental properties of matter. Now there may be more things out there that we don't know about. Maybe the universe is part of more universes that were formed. Maybe these particles we're detecting aren't the fundamental particles and that space itself has something going on inside of it that we don't know about yet. But the point is, as far as our physics understands things right now, we are probing at the foundations of these things. And it's only when we do that that we might discover, oh, there's, there's more. There's an infinite number. There's more of these things going on. And that's what I love about science. We're, we're investigating these things. We're learning about these things. And when we look out at the stars and say, I know why those work. I know why those are different colors. I know why that one's brighter than that. That's what it's all about, is understanding what's around you. So my advice to any of you, young or old, don't stop asking questions. Don't stop asking dumb questions. Because sometimes those are the ones that lead to the most profound answers that we can find. Yeah, that's it. I'm done. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. My goodness, that was, that was fabulously awesome.